So good evening, everyone, and good morning and uh, good afternoon. I bring you warm greetings from New Zealand, and I welcome you to the session. We're a, a small and uh, intimate group here, but uh, covering uh, many miles uh, across the world. I see we have participants from Kenya, uh, Uganda, Nigeria, New Zealand, um, and India um, so far, and I'm sure others will join as we uh, progress. Uh, as I just mentioned a couple of minutes ago, uh, we are recording the session so that you are aware that there will be a digital version um, of the session, assuming that the recording works out. So I'm just going to do a quick check that the recording is running. And that seems to be all working. So a very warm welcome to you all. I'm I'm based here in a a small town called Mosgiel, which is about 15 kilometers south of Dunedin, on the South Island of New Zealand. And um, this evening as well, I'm pleased to be joined by my colleague from the OER Foundation, uh, Dave Lane, who is uh, also in the South Island of New Zealand. I might. I just uh, get, hand over to him to introduce himself um, and and w welcome you to the session as well. Kia ora all. Um, yes, I'm Dave, Dave Lane and I'm the open source technologist with the foundation. And I have the pleasure of working with Wayne from day to day, albeit from a distance. Um, and uh, my role is just to assist Wayne a little bit in this um, using uh, or conducting this session and uh, just be warned I may um, I may mute any microphones that are, are creating any background noise um, so please if you're not speaking it would be great if you could mute your microphones um, but otherwise yeah we'll be we'll be trying to record this session and um, making it available for future reference for folks as well and I'll also be watching the uh, the public chat. So, if you have any questions, if you put them in there, if you don't, if you don't want to uh, speak them out, um, I'll make sure that we're uh, that I make Wayne aware of them before the end of the session, so that he can address them. Okay, nice to meet you all. Thanks, Dave. So, um, the purpose of the session is uh, to provide you with an overview of the OVRU learning environment, which is actually quite unique and uh, quite special. So let me just uh, activate a screen share here. Um, and I can show you a few quick slides to give you a bit of an overview. And um, then we'll actually have a look at some of the technologies. So what I want to do here is just switch this over to a full screen display here. And we should be good to go. I assume that the screen share is uh, coming through for you all. If you could do the thumbs up or um, indication in, in, in the chat window, if you can see the screen share. Um, so it looks all good. Let's get started. So at the very beginning, I, I, I always start with um, this very important aspect and just to make the statement that there is no form of educational delivery that is more cost effective, more scalable, or more sustainable than open educational resources. And uh, in part, this, this course that we're running now is part of the OVR for COVID initiative, uh, Leader 103, Learning in a Digital Age, uh, which and this particular micro course focuses on uh, OVR, copyright, and open licensing is in fact quite important in uh, pr providing the, the, the necessary knowledge and tools uh, for us to build more sustainable education futures. So, you know, I think that background is quite important as we move uh, uh, move forward. So, what I really want to do uh, this evening, or, or or your morning, depending on where you are located in the world, is really just run through some of the open technologies we are using. Uh, to support our work at the OER Foundation and our open online courses. So if you think about it, there, in, you know, there are some skills in life which may appear quite easy to learn, but are really quite complex. Uh, you can think about learning to uh, ride a push bicycle or uh, perhaps learning to swim. Um, these are complex skills 
And um, if you think about it, you can't really learn to ride a bicycle by reading a book, or you, you're not going to learn how to swim without getting your feet wet. And in, in many ways, if we're wanting to learn how to learn on the internet, we need to use the full range of internet tools that are available um, in order to gain the capacity and skills to be able to learn effectively on the internet. And that's an important design philosophy which has underpinned our work at the OER Foundation and the OERU. Our philosophy is to support learning on the internet rather than learning via a single application or software tool like a learning management system. So we have designed and developed an ecosystem of uh, tools that are spread across the internet. We have the hub of our, our, our course materials, which uh, is the course website. But this course website links through to a range of best of breed uh, in interaction and communication tools uh, with the ability to harvest or syndicate uh, the communications that happen across these distributed tools to a single course feed um, so that learners can see what is happening in the pro uh, during the progression of our courses. We've developed uh, an, an open source ecosystem uh, which is a representation of a next generation digital learning environment. And you'll see there by our technology wheel we actually use a wide range of open source technologies to support communications in our online courses. So for example, we use Mastodon as our um, social media website. Uh, Mastodon is an open source uh, so, uh, technology, very similar to Twitter, uh, but is entirely open source. Uh, at the OERU, uh, we encourage learners to uh, create their own blog websites uh, so that the artifacts of their learning and their learning journal blogs can be shared with the world, but more importantly, that learners can retain access to the content that they have generated long after the course has finished. Uh, because our, these blogging platforms are controlled by the learners, they will retain access to all the content that they've created we also have an, an internal commenting system called Wiki Educator Notes, uh, which is on the website. Uh, we, we have also integrated an amazing piece of open source software called Hypothesis, which gives learners the ability to be able to annotate any web page or PDF document that can be loaded in a browser anywhere on the internet, uh, which, as you'll appreciate, is quite powerful for supporting learning. Uh, we have a technology, uh, a social bookmarking technology, which enables learners to share links to websites that they have found quite useful in their studies. And uh, for many of you, you would have already uh, interacted with our discussion forum platform, which is powered by the Discourse open source uh, software engine. So you get the idea, we have a course website and a range of interaction technologies that are distributed across the web. And we'll have a look at a few examples of these technologies this evening. So I'm going to leave it there and actually start having a look at some of the um, actual technologies we're using rather than a representation of these technologies via a, a, a slideshow. So what I'm sh uh, showing you now is I've uh, moved to the, um, the the Leader 103 course website, and this is the home page for the Leader 103 course website. You'll see that all OERU courses are hosted on the course.oeru.org um, website uh, in the URL at the top of the screen there, uh, followed by the course code there, Leader 103. So this is the, the, the course homepage where all the course materials reside. So for us at the OERU, which is quite important, is we believe that learners should be able to access all the learning materials 
without the need to register a, a, an account or a password to access those materials. Uh, as, an, as, as an open education institution, uh, we believe that if you restrict access to learning materials behind a password, for all practical purposes, those materials are closed. So you will see um, learners will be able to gain access to any of the learning pathways, which are the individual units of study in any OERU course, without having to register on the course website. And so here's an example of one of the learning pathways uh, called Why Open Matters. And you will see, if you click on the bar at the top there, uh, the individual pages that make up this learning pathway. So uh, learners can read through the materials, uh, they can click on the next button to move to the next page in the sequence of this particular learning pathway, or alternatively, they can uh, open up the submenu here and click directly um, to go to the relevant subsection of this learning pathway via the menu as well. And so here's, you know, just a, a quick online quiz uh, to track progress on this particular learning pathway. But the real magic of the OERU uh, ecosystem is this page here, which you'll find under the interaction sections of all our course websites called the course feed. And so I've just opened up the course feed page, which would be coming, should be coming through for you in a moment. What this page is doing is, in fact, loading all the mentions and comments from learners who have posted uh, interactions on our distributed websites. Um, and this is the live course feed of Leader uh, 103 at the moment. You will see uh, that uh, Robin has uh, posted on the forum site and uh, under each of these interactions in the course feed in the footnote area you can actually see the source where these mentions or comments come from so uh, leticia has posted a comment on the course website which has come from you know at the course website as you can see there here you will see a post i um, posted uh, 41 minutes ago on mastodon uh, just advertising the start of this uh, of this session. Uh, we can find other examples here, uh, coming from uh, different websites. I've just loaded more notes there. I can scroll through here. Here, for example, you can see a an annotation uh, that was posted by MCJSA on a a web page on the internet where he's annotated uh, uh, some content on, uh, on a particular website. So you get the idea, we have this ability to be able to fetch posts that are posted on these distributed technologies across the internet into a single course feed on the course website. So what I'd like to do at this point in time is to actually look at some of these uh, technologies starting with our social media website, uh, which is called Mastodon. So Mastodon is a very interesting uh, technology because it's a federated technology. What that means is our Mastodon social media website is not controlled by a single corporate entity. It is, in fact, a, a website uh, that can be hosted by any individual or any organization uh, with the ability of having these distributed individual Mastodon websites communicating with each other. So that rather than having a single uh, website like Twitter where we uh, force all learners to comment on, we use this distributed ecosystem which is based on open source technologies. This particular Mastodon instance or this particular Mastodon server is hosted by the OERU, um, but it has the ability to connect with any Mastodon server in the world. 
So what you're looking at at the moment is my account on our OERU Mastodon server, uh, which is the home feed. And what is displayed in this home feed are all the individuals on Mastodon who I am following personally. So uh, you on your view of Mastodon will be different to the view I'm seeing uh, because you will have different followers on your own particular Mastodon instance. But what I wanted to point out to you here, uh, just by way of example, here's a post by my colleague uh, Dave Lane. Uh, and this post you'll see was posted on a different Mastodon instance. It is the New Zealand Open Source Software Society's instance of Mastodon. But I'm following Dave's account on that particular instance. So it's just a good illustration of the power of this technology that you are able to follow the uh, users on different Mastodon instances. If you haven't discovered this yet, I'd like to illustrate a very useful feature on, on Mastodon, and, and that is the ability to set a multi-screen, uh, a multi-column display for your own Mastodon account. So I'm logged into our Mastodon server. If I click here at the top next to my uh, username, uh, that down arrow, and I click on the Preferences option, um, we will go to the Preferences screen, and you will see that I have the ability here to toggle on the Advanced Web Interface, which I'm going to do right now. I'm going to toggle on the Advanced, um, or I'm going to enable the ad Advanced Web Interface. So I must just remember to save my changes by scrolling down and clicking on the Save Changes button here at the bottom. And you'll see now, if I go back to my Mastodon account, we're just waiting for that to load, you will see that I now have a multi-column display, uh, which is picking up the feeds from these different channels. So I have the home feed, which are all the people I'm following, on all the different instances of Mastodon. We have the local timeline feed here, which is the feed of all people who have accounts on our Mastodon instance, which you can follow there. You've also got a notifications column. If anyone at mentions you in a toot, we call posts on Mastodon toots. Um, or if you know somebody follows me, I get a notification. A handy feature when you enroll for a given OERU course is to actually search for the hashtag um, for that course. So the hashtag sign, which is the pound sign, let's look for leader 103. I'm searching there in the top left-hand column search bar. Uh, let's search for that feed. You'll see, yes, there is a hashtag feed there for leader 103. If I click on that, what you will see happening in the far right-hand column, we now have a dedicated column which is fetching every single toot on uh, our server which has been tagged with the hash leader 103 course code. And that's a handy feature if you are enrolled for a, a given course at OERU you can set up a, a search column. And in fact, what you can do is you can pin that column so that the next time that you log in, uh, you will get the feed for all the uh, leader uh, one, uh, or all the toots that are marked with the leader 103 hashtag. So just a couple of pointers uh, using our Mastodon instance. If there's any advice I can give for new account users, if you don't have an account already on our Mastodon instance, is most users forget to uh, change their display name and upload an avatar image of themselves. Um, so you'll see here, for example, a couple of users uh, have not loaded a personal avatar image or edited their display name. So you'll see here, for example, on, on, on my account, my display name is Wayne McIntosh, and there's an avatar image of myself there. But often new users who are not familiar with this technology forget to do that. But it's actually quite easy to alter or edit your um, display name. You just go back here 
to um, your username here on the left of the screen. If you click on the options, there's an option here to edit your profile. And then you just click on the edit profile link and that will take you to a new page where you can actually go and edit your display name um, and upload an, an avatar image. And then of course, remember to save your changes. So it's quick and easy to um, make sure that you have your display name and avatar image uploaded if you haven't done that yet. So that's just a brief overview of uh, our Mastodon uh, technology, which is an amazing social media uh, site that is running entirely on open source and is not reliant on uh, proprietary companies selling your data uh, for advertising purposes. In fact, we don't permit any advertising on any of our OERU websites. So that's a handy technology. Uh, the next technology I'd like to illustrate for you, which I think is uh, an, a very powerful technology to support learning, and that is the hypothesis uh, annotation uh, software. And so you'll see here in the course feed, there is a post here from this uh, leader 103 learner MCJSA. I believe his first na name is Mark. You'll see here that the timestamp is, is actually a link and you can actually link through to the source of these individual posts, which I'm now going to open up in a new tab. And I'm just going to wait a moment for that to load. And you'll see here, this is an annotation that MCJSA uh, posted on a, a, a website somewhere. And what you can do is you can then actually link through to the public posts of MCGSA there. I've just clicked on his link. And here we can see all the annotations that this particular user has made public on Hypothesis. And you'll see here right at the top um, a number of posts uh, uh, or a number of annotations have been posted to this website called Open Content. Dot org. And so what I can do is I can actually then, going to the right here, I can actually click on the individual annotations that this user has made on that web page. And I can also then go and visit those annotations in the context of the actual web page where they were made. You'll see there's a link there called Visit Annotations in Context. And so if I click on that link, it will take me to the uh, source web page where those annotations were made. Now, obviously, uh, before this webinar session, I've actually logged into my Hypothesis account, uh, as you can see there, in the top right hand of the uh, right hand screen, I, my username is logged in. But you would then need to log in yourself. Uh, on the Hypothesis website. If you don't have an account yet on Hypothesis, there are instructions in the course material how you can go about creating an account on Hypothesis. But what is particularly amazing, this is just a um, this open content web uh, page on the open internet. You can go and annotate any web page you want to. If I click on that actual annotation, you will see on the main web page the text that he's annotated is now highlighted in blue. And he's actually commented on that text. So there are a number of options. I can actually, if I wanted to, I could reply to that annotation uh, by just clicking on the reply link here below his annotation. You see, if I click on that arrow um, there below his annotation, a text box will appear where I can then reply to his annotation that he's made. But what I can also do is I can annotate my own text um, if I want to. So perhaps I want to make a comment on this subheading here. What you do is you highlight that subheading uh, by tracking your mouse, and you'll see if you've logged into Hypothesis and you've enabled the Hypothesis plugin, uh, an annotate option appears there. If you click on annotate, 
a text area box will appear on the right hand side there and then you can go ahead and you know comment on a particular or annotate a, a section of the text uh, on any web page or PDF document that can be displayed uh, in a web browser. But the trick here is, of course, if you want it to be shared uh, with the rest of your learners on Leader 103, uh, you must remember to add the course tag, as I'm going to do here. The course tag for this course is Leader 103. Make sure you hit the Enter button so that you can confirm that the tag has been registered. And make sure that you post publicly. Um, if you have the option of pu publishing uh, privately only to yourself, and that is useful if you're wanting to keep personal notes for any web page. But obviously, in the context of uh, an open course, you want to share your comments, so you you would you would post those publicly. And so we'll post those publicly. It will be registered, and um, in due course, our web servers will go out and uh, find that post in the course feed. Uh, just by way of information, uh, we go, our servers go out about roughly every 15 to 20 minutes to go and fetch posts that are tagged with the course feed. The last uh, aspect I'd like to just illustrate before we can op we, before we open up for any questions you may have is um, how to register your personal blog site uh, for harvesting in the course feed. You'll recall in the beginning of the presentation, uh, we encourage learners to create their own blog sites uh, for keeping track and keeping a learning journal. Uh, so that you have control of the artifacts that you are posting. So what I have here is just a, a, a demonstration blog site I created on WordPress. Um, perhaps you uh, have created your own blog on Blogger or some other uh, blogging platform. Uh, it doesn't matter which one you use. Uh, but the example I'm showing here is, is WordPress. So this is just a blog site I've created for demonstration purposes on WordPress. The point I want to emphasize here is with blogging platforms, there are two URLs, really. One is the URL you use for editing your blog site. So that's kind of a private URL that you have access to to be able to edit and publish your blog posts. Um, this URL cannot be seen by the general public. Then the, the second URL with a blog plat blogging platform is what we call the public URL. And uh, on WordPress, you'll see on the right top right-hand corner here, I have a link which is uh, called visit the site, that is visit the blog site that I published. In other platforms, there may be other links to uh, access your uh, public view of the blog site. Uh, but I'm just going to click on that now. And you'll see now I'm taking to a different URL, which is the public URL of this blog site. So the public URL is, of course, the URL which any individual will be able to access on the internet. And it's the public URL we need to use to register your blog for harvesting on the course feed. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to copy that blog URL, the public blog URL, before I go back to the course site here on Leader 103. So you'll see I'm, I have already enrolled on the Leader 103 website just to save time during the session. But if you don't have an account um, or you need to log in, uh, the link at the top right-hand corner of the course website is where you need to go to manage uh, your account settings. So I am already logged in. If you don't already have an account on uh, the course website, you would create one here. And via this link, uh, you, you can manage various aspects of your accounts. Uh, like editing your profile, or if you need to change your password. You can unenroll from any OERU course if you want to, 
or re-enroll at a later stage. Um, but the feature I want to show you here is how you register your public blog URL uh, on the OERU website. And you'll see here is an option, the add your uh, blog feed for scanning link. And all you need to do um, is click on this add the blog feed for scanning link. And it opens up an amazing software service called the Blog Feed Finder, which was coded and developed by my colleague here, Dave Lane. So if you have any uh, complaints about this amazing software, he's the man that you need to contact. But this is really an amazing piece of technology. Uh, what you do in the Blog Feed Finder is you simply paste the public URL of your own blog site and you submit it. And what the server does, it actually behind the scenes, it will go and have a look to see if it can identify a valid blog feed, which is either in what we call the RSS format, which is, stands for real simple syndication, or it could be an Atom format, uh, which is a re machine readable format uh, that servers understand to be able to uh, post uh, information. And so you'll see in this particular case, the website tells me, yes, um, it's verified that that is a real blog site. Uh, it has verified finding an actual feed. Um, and it's giving me uh, a comments feed, which is an alternate feed, which is not really a feed that we're uh, looking for harvesting purposes. So it gives useful information about what uh, feeds it's found on that particular website. If you're interested in the technical details, you can actually hover over those links and it will provide more technical information. But the real important information here is it tells us that it's found a valid feed uh, that we can use to register. And it's uh, recommending the RSS feed that should be registered. And all you need to do is, um, in my particular case, obviously working at the OERU, I'm registered for a large number of OERU courses. So what the website is doing, it's listing every single uh, website I'm registered for at the OERU. But in your particular case, it might only just be one or two websites, depending on how many OERU uh, websites you've registered on. But all you need to do is then go to your particular course website. And in this particular case, I'm interested in assigning that blog website, which we've searched for, to my Leader 103 feed. And so all I need to do now is you either need to assign, if you haven't assigned a blog feed before, there will be an assign button. But in my particular case, I'm wanting to, to replace my old feed with the new one. So I just click on replace. It gives me a um, indication success that my blog has now been assigned with um, the course website. So what will happen now is any time that you post a blog post on your course website after you've registered it, on condition that you've actually added via the blogging website that actual course tag, either a tag on WordPress or a label via Blogger. Both of those uh, pieces of software have the ability to add tags or labels. It will actually go out and fetch uh, posts or links to posts on your blog site. So I'm just scanning through the course feed here to see if there um, are any blog sites. There's one here. Let me just see if there are any others lower down here of other learners uh, just scanning through. You know, this is a live feed, so there was one over there, but I think that's just a practice blog. Um, we have lots of learners on this course, uh, in fact, 2,300 learners. So uh, just taking a wee while to scan through here to blog posts. Uh, let's have a look here. Scanning down, this is the thing, when you want to find a blog post quickly, uh, you don't find them. Oh, oh here's one. Uh, so you'll see here, here's a, 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 a mention in the feed from Tru Trudy Jacobson. 
Uh, and I can see that this is a blog post. You can see there in the footer, it says blog. Um, if I click through to that link, uh, which is busy loading now on a new tab, you can see here is the blog post that Trudy Jacobson posted on her own blog site. Um, and so this is the multiple choice question learning challenge in Leader 103. She's designed a multiple choice question, which she's sharing with the learner group. And you can see here at the bottom, she's actually via WordPress added the label Leader 103. And because it has that label, uh, our servers go out and have a look for blog posts that are registered on our OER site that contain the course code. And that is why that uh, blog post has been harvested for the course feed. So that's basically how the course feed works. So um, just getting back to the course feed, you'll see the annotation I posted um, earlier on, the test annotation. You'll see here, this is my comment. Uh, earlier in the web webinar, I posted that you know test comment. And you'll see that that annotation has now been harvested. The harvester goes out about every 15, 20 minutes uh, looking for uh, posts and uh, interactions uh, that are distributed across the web. So if you have posted something and it doesn't appear immediately in the course feed, you know, just come back again in about 15 uh, or 20 minutes time uh, to check that it's been harvested. So I'm going to leave it there for the time being and then open up the floor to questions. Uh, given that we are a relatively uh, smallish group, uh, if you do have a webcam and microphone enabled, please feel free uh, to ask your questions live. Um, or alternatively, uh, you can post your questions um, in the, the chat area. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm just going to minimize the screen here on the recording and uh, open up the floor for questions. Do we have any questions? Oh, this is going to be easy. I'll get an early night tonight. There, there are a few uh, few folks that are typing um, in chat there, so I suspect there may be questions, but we'll find out shortly, I hope. And by the way, thank you very much to Suresh who confirmed that he has been able to uh, access this big blue button via um, a, an iPad running S Safari rather than uh, the normally recommended Chrome. <laughs> Wonderful. So, yes. That's good. Well, while we're waiting for the questions to be posted for any of the learners that are part of the OER for COVID initiative, uh, which is an initiative sponsored uh, in, or we're carrying out in partnership with the Commonwealth of Learning, uh, UNESCO, uh, the Open Education Global Consortium, um, and uh, the World Bank uh, in supporting uh, education institutions in this transition to online learning during the COVID pandemic. If any of you are members of the OER for COVID initiative, and I'm sure many of you are, Please uh, be aware that uh, we've received funding support from the New Zealand National Commission for UNESCO to provide access for OE, OER for COVID collaborators uh, to our, uh, a big blue button account, um, the technology we're using here uh, for the web conferencing to be able to support OER advocacy and uh, capacity building initiatives in open education. Um, so uh, if, if you do want an account, uh, just post via the, the uh, relative channels for the OER for COVID initiative. So I'll leave it there and have a look to see if we've got any questions coming in. So uh, one of the questions I, I see there from Miyazi Hazam uh, is the 
activities in each of our courses, how will these be assessed or evaluated as part of the course? So within any OERU course, there are a number of activities. Um, the activities may just be a, a short, you know, little quiz embedded in the materials or posting a comment on the discussion forum uh, or something more substantive, uh, creating a, a, a blog post. Uh, we, we actually do not evaluate the activities as such. We only evaluate activities for learners that are seeking formal academic credit. So if learners are seeking formal academic credit for any one of the OERU courses, they then uh, approach one of the assessing partners and submit the assessments that are required uh, for formal academic credit. What I should point out, in fact, and in fact, I forgot to illustrate that, is we do have for Leader 103 a competency test in copyright and creative commons, where you can earn a, a competency certificate as, you know, it's a PDF certificate if you successfully pass that test. And that certificate uh, is entirely free of charge. And this is part of our initiative as UNESCO uh, chair network to support capacity development. So what I should maybe point out is that this initiate the screen share there again. Um, let me just go to the actual website here. Uh, in the course guide section, you will is, oh, and the screen share is not coming through yet. Sorry about that. I should have been paying more attention. Right, there we go. So on the course website, uh, under the actual, uh, well, under the course guide section, uh, you'll find a link to the optional pretest. So I'm just loading that there. So uh, this is the information you will need uh, to uh, take the pretest and or the final competency test uh, on copyright and creative commons. And you'll see there's an example of the certificate that you can earn uh, if you successfully pass the test. And so what you need to do is the information is provided there. You need to create an account on our Moodle website um, and then go to the uh, certificate of competency link on our Moodle website. I am going to log in here. One of the, uh, what you're seeing here is I'm actually using an open source password manager. Uh, many of our learners complain, oh, there are too many websites that I need to create accounts on and I can't remember my passwords. Um, I, uh, we strongly recommend that uh, our learners actually start using uh, secure password managers and we can re recommend this password manager, it's called Bitwarden, uh, which runs on open source technology. The bitwarden.com uh, provide uh, a, a, a free tier account for using uh, one of these password managers, but it's a very secure way of managing passwords across different websites. So um, you'll see that my password has been stored uh, for the Moodle website here, and I can immediately uh, log in to the Moodle website for the um, pretest and certificate of competency. I already have an account on our Moodle website, so I didn't go through the process of actually creating an account. Uh, you'll need to do that yourself. But you'll see there all the instructions. And here is the actual pretest. Um, it consists of uh, 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 30 questions, I believe. It will take about 20 minutes to complete. I recommend that, uh, you know, even before you've started uh, working through the copyright and creative commons section, you know, take the pretest if you want to. It's a good way to see where your knowledge is at. It doesn't matter if you pass or fail or whatever. The, 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 the marks that are recorded don't count against you in any way. But it's a good way to identify, uh, you know, areas for improvement and actually how the competency test works. So, you know, you just click on start the pretest. It will load the, uh, the, uh, the pretest here. And then you work through the actual multiple choice questions. And you'll see the five true false questions on copyright for the uh, pretest, 
five uh, Creative Commons, true false questions, 10 multiple choice for copyright, 10 multiple choice questions for Creative Commons. And you can take that pretest. The system will mark, uh, grade your uh, achievement on, on the pretest. And it'll give you an idea of uh, your existing knowledge of Creative Commons and uh, copyright. Um, and then after taking the course, uh, you can then take the full competency test. If I go back here to the website, you'll see below the pretest. If I scroll down, uh, there's the full competency test, and you can then just click on the you know to take the competency test, and then uh, this is a you know a much larger test. Uh, there are 50 items in the test, so it'll take a little bit longer, maybe 40 to 40 minutes to an hour, depending on how fast you are. Uh, but if you're successful in achieving a 50% pass mark, you will be issued with the competency certificate free of charge. Um, uh, we, we want to support your achievement in uh, Creative Commons and copyright. You can take that test as many times as you like until you pass it. We want you to achieve success. Um, so uh, I encourage all learners uh, to take the competency test. So... Let's stop the screen share there and get back to the questions. Were there any other questions I missed in the meantime, Dave? There's been a little bit of discussion here um, regarding uh, the certificates. And Vera has been asking about um, something that I'm not familiar with, which is Gnomeo or Nomeo, uh, which appears to be something related to Moodle. And she's just, uh, and also Joseph has asked about the specific need um, to get a blog with a .com address. And uh, hopefully- So, so Dave, maybe you can explain. Uh, so yeah. first off, learners do not need to purchase their own domain to host their blogs. They can make use of one of the free tier versions offered by WordPress or Blogger or one of the other websites. But it is, of course, also possible for you to register your own domain that you have registered and pay, pay for. So I'm just going to maybe just leave that to Dave just to explain a little bit about um, you know, allocating your own domain and uh, how those processes work, just you know, to give a high-level overview for anybody that uh, is wanting to use their own domain for their blog sites. Sure, yeah. So anyone anyone in the world can buy a domain or well you don't actually buy one you you effectively lease a domain name from one or more countries domain registrars the dot com and dot org and dot net domains are sort of designed to be global domains but most other countries most countries have their own um domain like uh, in new zealand we have the dot nz domain and um there's also Places like the um, in India, you have the .in um, domains. In other countries, every country has its own two-letter uh, domain suffix, and usually each country has its own domain registry. And you can go to any one of a number of websites uh, that allow you to purchase or or conduct or create that lease of a domain name which could be something based on your name, or it could be a brand uh, that you associate yourself with. Um, it could be a business name, something like that. And you can buy a domain name, uh, which you then have to maintain. You renew it each year, typically. And uh, you don't have to be in the country that you're buying the domain for. Generally, you, you can buy domains uh, in any part of the world for most most countries, but each country decides its own policy on, on that. So. It's great to have your own domain. It's a great way of um, branding yourself, and, and it's it's a good way of uh, ensuring that your identity is is secure online. Um, however, there's no need to do so for the purposes of any of the OERU courses. Um, as regard regarding the blogs, typically with a blog, you can you can use a blog service most of which or many of which are free, some of which you can choose to pay for, and you have to decide if that's worth worth your while to do so. Um, but uh, in many cases, you'll just get a subdomain, which is going to be some name dot 
say, WordPress.com or .blogger.com or some other uh, blog supplier's uh, domain name. And so you then have uh, something that is more cost effective um, but may not uh, re re represent your own brand. So you don't have to choose a particular um, brand domain for, or, or website or blog domain or blog engine for, for any of our courses. We try to be as uh, independent or neutral on, on the technology choices you make as possible. Yep. So I see we have a question here from somebody asking, uh, let's just scroll past me, somebody's asked about integrating hypothesis within Moodle. So um, the two ways in which you can do that, one, there is an integration of, hy of hypothesis within Moodle, but that is a commercial service that is, I believe it's a commercial service that's offered through the hypothesis network where the host of the Moodle website has a, an arrangement with Hypothesis um, to integrate that plug-in within Moodle. The other alternative, of course, is within Moodle, you can uh, invite users to create their own accounts on Hypothesis, which they can then use um, for annotating uh, web pages. And you would be able, with an RSS plug-in within Moodle, be able to harvest an RSS feed uh, watching for particular tags uh, associated with the um, hypothesis annotations. So there will be ways in which you could do that without uh, incurring costs, but the easiest way is going to be to encourage learners to create their own accounts on hypothesis because then they retain access uh, to all their, their own links and annotations. And all you need to do within your own learning management system is then to harvest that feed uh, so people are aware of links uh, that are posted. And there are um, RSS uh, plugins for, for Moodle uh, that you can integrate, but you'll obviously need to speak to your systems administrator to uh, integrate that. So that's in terms of the question about integration of hypothesis within Moodle. Um, so thank you very much, Vera, for the link. I'll have to have a read of that um, regarding gnomeo.com. I don't, I'm, I'm not familiar with it. Um, I, I wanted to mention one thing, Wayne, which um, at, the, at the start of the presentation, you uh, talked about how our OER materials, all being OERs, are openly available without a login, without needing to have a password to access them. But then we also talk quite a bit about people creating accounts on things to be able mm -hmm. to access services. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to make sure that people understand why we why we do that. Um, mm -hmm. Just because uh, there are some problems. We, we want to make sure that all of the learning materials are available um, without someone even needing to give us their name or any other information about themselves. So with complete privacy, they don't have to, they don't have to, um, commit themselves in any way. Um, however, when people start to interact with, with our services and interact with one another, we feel that it's quite important that they do so from a position of being identifiable so that we can ensure, for example, that they're not um, uh, providing spam or putting spam into our services and that they may not be in a position, you know, to, that they won't be in a position where they might be abusive uh, and not and not be able to be, um, you know, have no have no sense of um, um, th there's no mechanism by which we can uh, uh, control that that interaction if there's if there's some misuse of our services, mm -hmm. and also in some cases it's very useful from a from a user's perspective to be able to return to places that they were before and have information saved for them in various contexts and various tools that we provide. And in that case, they need to have an, a, uh, an account to associate that saved information with. So just to explain to people why there may be sort of an uh, apparent contradiction there. 
Um, but that's that's why we do require an account for some things, both to provide identity for people in places where they're interacting with others and to store information related to that that person. So for example, in our Moodle, I don't think you can access that without logging in, but that's also where you, you show your ability uh, to <laughs> master the materials. Um, and that's something that only an individual can do. So I just, um, I was, while you were chatting, Dave, I was just scrolling through the questions. I see there's one here that I missed from, from Joseph, who uh, had indicated that he's, he's registered for Leader 103, um, and then asked, well, does he need to go through Leader 101 uh, before uh, finishing Leader 103? Uh, just a quick response, no, you don't need to do that. Uh, the uh, four courses that all form part of learning in the digital age are designed uh, to be completed independently. So if you want to start with Leader 103, that's fine. Go ahead with 103 and then at a later stage you can do Leader 101. And then if you're interested, 102 and Leader 104, they, they are all very valuable courses uh, for learning to learn, how, uh, learning to learn on the internet. Uh, in fact, the Learning in a Digital Age uh, series of courses was awarded the Commonwealth of Learning Award for Excellence in Distance edu Education Materials last year. So um, it's a high quality course. But more importantly is um, given that this is an OER enabled course based entirely on open education resources, and given that many of our higher education institutions around the world are, are, are grappling with the transition to online learning during the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, you are free to adopt the Le Learning in the Digital Age course locally at your own institution. And you can even, because the assessments that are um, have been developed for that course are published under an open license, which means uh, your institution can reuse those assessments uh, the assessment rubrics which are used for grading learners, they are all published freely and openly. You could quite easily uh, adopt that course locally at any one of your tertiary education institutions. And it would actually be a very good fit uh, within degree programs uh, at the first year level that have elective options in them, right? Because many degrees at the first year level, you can choose between one or two courses. Um, so you are most welcome to use learning in a digital age uh, locally uh, during these times and in the future. It's open source, it's available online, you don't have to spend any money or any effort in getting those course materials online, you're, you are free to use them. That's the reason we exist. Uh, we exist to share education courses with the world. And not only are you free to use the Learning in a Digital Age courses, any of our OERU courses in business studies and arts, uh, you, you can ad adopt and reuse them locally at your institution. Uh, this is the mission of our charitable organization, is to share open online courses uh, with anyone that wants, wants to use them. So please make use of that opportunity. I know that many institutions are under great stress at the moment. Uh, in trying to transition to online learning and you know if you can use high quality open online courses that already exist uh, why wouldn't you do that um, there would also be opportunities to for example to start translating some of these courses for local languages uh, I mean thinking for example uh, it would be great to have a Hindi uh, version of learning in a digital age for example and so later this month, after the Learning in a Digital Age course, we're going to be offering another open course for free. It's called Digital Skills for Collaborative OER Development. We will actually provide free capacity development in how to develop and design course materials for this OERU platform that you have you know, just seen here. Um, and you know, maybe that would be an interesting project. Um, perhaps there are a couple of colleagues in India or um, a couple of uh, colleagues in, in Kenya uh, who um, would, you know, want to translate these courses into local languages if that's appropriate and perhaps a need in your own country. So I just wanted to put that out there.
I'm just quickly scrolling through the last questions here before we sign off. Um, um, I just wanted to mention one thing. <laughs> I managed to click the wrong button and disconnect myself there for a moment, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to mention that one of the things that we discussed at our partner meeting in Dublin uh, last year uh, with, particularly with some of our colleagues in Africa, was the uh, desirability of having people in countries where English is used quite a lot, but is maybe not the most common language, of having mm -hmm. um, like a, an overview or a summary or a, maybe an introductory um, uh, piece in, in the language, the local language, uh, which we could then associate with the course so that when people are looking at these courses, they might find uh, an introductory segment that is in their local language that they could then listen to, which would give them um, the necessary introduction and help them uh, you know make the climb up the into the into the course materials uh, more comfortably. Um, so yeah, if anyone wants to, consider uh, recording something like that. I don't think it needs to be anything particularly formal, but anything like that would be really much appreciated as well. Yeah. I think that would be a huge value addition. Thanks, Dave. So look, we, um, we're at the top of the hour, and I, I, I said we would finish within the hour. Um, so I'm going to start wrapping up here, but I I really thank you for your your gift of time and you know taking some time out to to join us. Um, hopefully, uh, we've had success with this video recording, and I'll post that online for uh, the benefit of uh, everyone who was not able to make the session. But uh, thank you very much, and uh, I look forward to seeing you online during Leader One Hundred and Three. For those of you that are well versed in using these um, digital technologies. Please uh, uh, pay your learning forward by, you know, helping others that you see are struggling a little. I mean, feel free to post a supporting comment or, you know, providing advice. Uh, we are all educators. We are working together. And um, I, I look forward to us building more sustainable education futures uh, for all. So I thank you for being with us. And um, I wish you a, a lovely day going forward. Goodbye, all.